Wonderful. Okay, so it is uh, my great pleasure to welcome uh, Mario Silverina, who is a very famous uh, professor in metamaterials working in the University of Lisbon. And I actually uh, remember vividly uh, the Metamaterials 2017 uh, conference when Mario was the chair of the TPC committee and he did a wonderful job. And so uh, without further ado, I would like now to uh, give uh, the mic to uh, Mario and he will talk about non-reciprocal and non-hermission material response inspired by semiconductor transistors. Mario. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. Thanks so much for the, for your group, for the kind invitation. It's a big pleasure to be here. Again, I apologize for this uh, delay uh, and uh, I'll try to compensate it uh, uh, so that everyone, so that we finish on time. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about non-reciprocal materials inspired by transistors. Let me uh, just uh, one slide of motivation. Um, so I work mostly on electromagnetics and uh, one of the, uh, directions that has been exploited in uh, recent years uh, is this issue of trying to have non-reciprocity uh, without magnetic fields. So the standard solution to have non-reciprocal devices that enable one-way propagation, like just goes in one direction, but not in the opposite direction, is to use uh, for, for rights, for example, bias with the magnetic field, but this has a number of inconveniences because these structures are bulky and so on. So uh, the starting point of this work is, can we do something similar, but without magnetic fields, just with the bias, electric bias. And if you start thinking about this a little bit, even if you are familiar with, uh, uh, with circuits um, that are used conventional, to have one-way devices, they are quite standard, you use transistors. And so this uh, was our motivation. And what the question that we asked ourselves is, can we have like the operation of a transistor, which is, if you want to see it, uh, you can describe it as a zero dimensions device because it's a point device. You don't have dimensions in terms of propagation, but can you have the analog of this in a metamaterial where the wave can propagate in space in three directions of space? So uh, to find this analog of a transistor, but in a material, uh, a good starting point is to look at the operation of a standard transistor. In this case, the MOSFET transistor. So the MOSFET transistor uh, is represented in this slide that you see here. And it, it is correct. it's a very simple device and at the same time uh, enables, uh, well, uh, very powerful signal processing. And it is based on this conducting channel. And we have two terminals, the source, the drain, and you can act on the width of the channel and thereby control its conductivity by acting on the gate. So if you apply an electric field along Z, which is this direction, you're going to tailor the width of this channel. And so in this manner, you can think that uh, when you act on the gate with the electric field along Z, you are changing the conductivity along X, okay? So can we have this in a metamaterial? So what would be the analog? So we just have to basically look at this type of constructive relation and transpose it to a medium and see what we get in these uh, circumstances. So we imagine for now, just conceptually, something like this. So a bulk structure that behaves like a transistor. Uh, I'm going to, to describe to you some realizations a little bit later, so don't worry too much with this. And if you want to imitate what I just described, so we want to control the response along X if you apply something along Z. So in a material, the response can be described, for example, by the susceptibility, is this guy. And it gives us the response of the polarization vector to the electric field. And so what we want is that the response along X, which would be this component of the tensor, should depend on the electric field along the gate, along Z. And so we arrive to this very simple constitutive relation that we'll use like a toy model just to see what happens, okay? And so we imagine that we have a material described by this. So it's a diagonal tensor. And the XX component depends on EZ, so it's a nonlinear material in the same way that the transistor, as we know, is a nonlinear device. Okay, so what do we do with this? So we try to use it in the same way that people use transistors. And uh, the way that people use transistors, so I put here some inset, 
if you use transistors for something like for amplification or for isolation or for something of the sort, you always bias the transistor at some point, which is indicated in this curve. So you put like some static voltage along the drain source channel and you fix the point of operation somewhere. And then you do the processing, processing around that point, which means that you apply a bias and then you consider small perturbations around the bias, okay? So one point I want to emphasize, even though the device is non-linear, uh, you are going to bias it and then you are going to operate it with some more variations around the bias. And in that context, it will be, it's a linear system after you bias it and just consider small perturbations. So this is the analysis. You can write that the electric field is going to be some bias component. So the index zero means that it's a bias plus some signal variation. So this is like the frequency variation of part of the signal, this delta E. For the polarization vector, you do the same. So P will be some P0, which is the static response to the electric field, plus some perturbation. So considering this, now what you have to do is pick your constitutive relation that I showed you here, and you just apply a Taylor expansion. So you linearize this response. So if you do this, it's very simple uh, procedure, as you can imagine and it can be transposed to other type of phenomena, for example, in the context of uh, mechanics and so on, where you have even stronger nonlinearities. And uh, what you have is this uh, type of response. So it's, this is very curious. So this is the response of the signal part of the polarization vector to the signal part of the electric field. And so you see that it depends, of course, on the bias field, which are these two components, EX0, and EZ0, okay? And uh, the one very important feature that you notice immediately when you look at this formula is that even though the tensor with which we started in the beginning was symmetric, so this one, you see it's a symmetric tensor, after you linearize it for this type of coupling, you see that you get something that is not symmetric. So this is the origin of the non-emission response and of the non-reciprocity. So if you want to operate to have this non-reciprocal non response, you see that you need this EX0, which is the bias field along X to be non-zero. So this is analogous to a transistor. So in a transistor, so the X direction is the drain to source direction, this one that I'm showing. And this one must be non-zero, similar to a transistor. So of course, this is the response of the polarization to the electric field, the, DC, the AC part. Uh, now you can write this in terms of equivalent permittivity. So the permittivity is essentially what I have here plus one, the normalized uh, permittivity, the relative permittivity. So it's this formula. And so you see that for this model that we are playing with, we uh, have a material response of this type. So it's a, an isotropic material, evidently, you have a tensor, but the curious point is this element. So the interesting point is this element that you see on the uh, top uh, right corner, epsilon xz, which is non-zero, depends on the bias field, and is not paired by this one on the bottom, where you have zero. And so, of course, the primitivity tensor is non-emission and is non-symmetric, and so we also have a non-emission response and non-reciprocal. Notice that for this model, and this is very important, this tensor is real-valued, completely real-valued, okay? And if it's real-valued, means another important thing means it's time reversal symmetric, okay? I'm not going to discuss so much this, but this is also a very curious thing. So you have non-reciprocity because of this property, epsilon is different from the transpose, but at the same time, it's time reversal symmetric. So let's see if, let's imagine we can have this type of responses and let's see what do they imply. And we consider the simplest problem that you can consider, the propagation of a plane wave in this metamaterial. And so we look for plane wave solutions of the Maxwell's equations, very standard uh, problem and very simple problem. And so as you expect, so the wave vector of the plane wave is K, uh, you assume this type of variation and it's a non-magnetic response, so trivial permeability. And as you expect, you get some kind of dispersion equation or secular equation, the very standard one. Now, to make things simple, we are going to even simplify things more. I'm going to concentrate in the entire talk in the direction of propagation along Y. So the Y direction is the direction perpendicular to the plane that contains, so it's, let me just bring the figure, maybe it's easier. So the Y direction, it's the direction perpendicular 
to this plane. Okay, so drain to source is X, Z is the gate, Y is perpendicular. So I'm always going to be considering waves propagating along Y, just to make things simple. So let me go back to where I was. And, um, and the field is biased along X, which is the equivalent of the drain to source direction in the transistor problem. So if you do the, anal the analysis and if you find the plane waves, you don't find apparently anything too much peculiar. So you find that as you expect, you have two polarizations. One of them you can call, uh, and, and both of them are transverse electromagnetic modes. So they are perpendicular. Uh, the, the, the electric field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So everything standard. The propagation constants will be real valued. And in particular, you find that you have something that you can call an ordinary wave. Uh, because this electric field is directed along, let's say, an optical axis, along the x direction, the direction of the bias, with a certain propagation constant, very standard. Now, you have another wave, as you can expect from a crystal that is uh, an isotropic, that will be an extraordinary wave. So this is the extraordinary wave. Propagation constant is also real valued, but, uh, and, uh, but this one, uh, well, th this is the polarization. Okay. So what is uh, special here? So it is special if you start looking at the geometrical orientation of the two vectors, of the two polarizations. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, you see that this one has a component along X and this one has a component along X and along Z. So this means that they are not orthogonal. And so you have this type of uh, relation between them. Uh, there is an angle theta, which for normal materials, it should always be 90 degrees, but for this metamaterial, because it's non-emission, you get this uh, theta uh, that will be non-zero, which means that the angle between them is 90, 90 degrees minus theta. So this happens because the permittivity tensor is non-emission. So because it's non-emission, the eigenvectors, if you want, they don't need to be orthogonal. And so the two polarizations are valid, but not orthogonal. And so we can characterize this angle theta. It depends on two things. It depends on this interesting parameter epsilon xz, uh, which comes because of the nonlinearity and the, the bias. And it depends on the difference between the two diagonal elements. So actually, this is a peculiar thing. I'm not going to explore it much. But of course, as you can expect, the effects that you will get in this type of system depend on the angle theta. If this is essentially what characterizes the deviation from a standard system. What I would like to point out is that you can have a large angle theta, even with a small parameter epsilon xz, it, well, and this happens because of the, uh, the denominator. You see, it's the difference between the two diagonal elements. And so if, this, if the two diagonal elements are close to each other, then this theta can even be large, even if you have an effect that is not so strong. Okay, so let, let me show you what we can get with this material. So let me, I start by mentioning non-reciprocity and that non-reciprocity enables propagation in two directions uh, asymmetric. Let me show you that if you have this ma material or metamaterial that you can have an optical isolator, an electromagnetic isolator. And so we proposed uh, um, a design for this in, in our article. And uh, this is the design. So basically it's this MOSFET metamaterial. We call it the MOSFET metamaterial because of the analogy with the transistor biased along X, which is equivalent to the direction of the drain to source. And then we put two polarizing grids uh, at the input and output interfaces. So you see here the two polarizing grids at the input at the output. And uh, let me explain exactly what are the properties of these grids. So they are just conventional polarizers. We consider them to be ideal polarizers such that if the electric field is parallel to these wires, you can think of them as uh, absorbing wires. So if the electric field is parallel to these wires, the wave will be absorbed for this polarization. If the electric field is perpendicular, the wave just goes through with uh, no interaction with the grids. And they are exactly perpendicular. So you should uh, do this in such a way that, uh, so th this is the X direction, which is the direction of the ordinary wave that I mentioned previously. And so this output grid should be perpendicular to this X direction. And this one should be, uh, uh, perpendicular to the uh, Z direction. Okay, so, uh, so this is the behavior of the grids, as I mentioned. So let me show you that this behaves as an ideal isolator. 
And uh, this is easy to explain. So uh, for this, we I'm going to consider two transmissions. So first from the right to the left, and I'm going to show that from the right to the left, nothing goes through. Everything will be blocked by this device. So how does it work? So if you want to transmit from the right to the left, in order that the wave can go through this uh, polarizing grid that I'm showing here, the electric field must be along X, must be perpendicular to these wires, okay? And so when it arrives to the material, which you see here, it's going to excite only the ordinary wave because this is the direction of the ordinary wave, which is the X direction. So this is the input field. When it gets inside the material, it's still the same polarization. There is no polarization conversion. It propagates to the other side, but when it gets to the other side, it sees the other grid, which is exactly rotated by 90 degrees. And so the other grid, if it's an ideal grid, it just absorbs this wave. And so it kills the, 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 the propagation. So no transmission. Let's see what happens when you have transmission in the opposite direction. So now from the left to the right. So now if you want to go from the left to the right, the only way that you can pass the first grid is if your field is along Z, because the component along X is absorbed. And so you can imagine that at the input, you basically have a field along Z, but now the important point is that Z is not an eigen polarization of the material. And so actually the closest to this, it's the extraordinary wave, but the extraordinary wave has a small component along X. So this means that this polarization is going to excite both the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave, mostly the, the extraordinary, but a little bit of the ordinary. And so because of this, it means that at the output, uh, the polarization changed. And so it's not anymore along Z, it has a component along X. So this component along, along X can go through the last grid, and so you can have an output signal, okay? So it's just this. And notice that this is a very general solution in the sense that basically what we are just exploiting is that the two eigen polarizations are not orthogonal, that's all. And so because they are not orthogonal, you can have this effect. Okay, let me show you now the actual performance, performance of this, taking into account everything. So of course I didn't discuss multiple reflections and uh, stuff of the sort because this material is not matched with air and so on. So we did some simulations taking into account everything. And let me show you uh, the transmission coefficients that we get. And so this is an example. So we assume that you can have a metamaterial with these parameters, two, 2.5 and the cross term 0.2. And we computed the transmission. So as I mentioned, in one direction, it's exactly zero for all frequencies. So I don't need to show you anything. And this is for the direction left to right. So for the direction left to right, you see that it depends on the thickness. So this is transmission coefficient as a function of thickness uh, for a fixed frequency. And uh, what you see is that there is an optimal thickness so if it's very, uh, very thin, the material, uh, very little goes through. If you start increasing the thickness, the transmission level increases, in this example, up to 0 0.8. Uh, but it's not forever. If you increase it even more, it starts dropping. This is what we see here. So there is an optimal uh, thickness. So you can find what is this optimal thickness. It is related to the difference between the propagation constants of the ordinary and the extraordinary waves. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this later so you will uh, have a more clear understanding why this happens. For now, uh, just to mention, so this is the optimal thickness that you see here. So it's related to the difference between the two uh, propagation constants. And uh, well, this is the exact solution in red, taking into account multiple reflections. This is some approximate formula that we derived. So this is the first example. So the second example, uh, what we are going to do uh, so you remember that I mentioned that the strength of the effect depends on this angle theta that controls the angle between the two uh, eigenvectors. So one way to increase this angle, well, we could increase this parameter, obviously, or we can make these two more similar. This is what I mentioned previously. So this is what I'm going to do next. I'm going to make these two more similar. It's 2.5, now it's 2.1. So they're more close. Because of this the effect, uh, the non-reciprocity effect and the non-emission effect will be stronger. And indeed, if you look at the plot, it's still the transmission left to right as a function of thickness, normalized thickness. 
you see indeed that the effect is stronger. Namely, if you look at the transmission, you see that the level of transmission increased. Now, if you notice the, the interesting thing, of course, we expect the effect to be stronger and we have an ideal non-reciprocal device if you could have this material. Now, what is interesting is if you look at the transmission level and you may find something a little bit surprising is that the transmission level is above one. So there is gain. And so this indicates that there is optical gain in this system, okay? Well, this happens because it's not an emission. And so let's understand what is the origin of the optical gain. So this device can behave, can provide not only a non-reciprocal response, which means symmetric transmissions, but it can also provide amplification. So let's see how does this work. Let's look at the non-emission effects and where do they come from? And so to illustrate this, I start with something relatively simple. Uh, we are going to look at what happens if you have two superposi a superposition of the two plane wave modes that propagate in this material, okay? So they are just standard plane waves, as I mentioned. Propagation constants are real valued, just a peculiar feature that they are not orthogonal. So if you consider one of the plane waves alone, let's say the ordinary wave, uh, you will not see anything peculiar. The amplitude is always constant in the material. And so of course, if the amplitude is always constant, the power that the wave transports is always the same, which is the same as saying the pointing vector uh, is a constant in the entire material for a plane wave. Now let's just change this picture a little bit and see that it leads to something that is rather counterintuitive or a bit unexpected or different from the usual things. So let's consider the superposition of the two modes. This is what we have here, the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave. And we just put them together at the same time. And specifically, I'm interested in the pointing vector because we just saw there is amplification. So how is this possible? And so you have two modes, you superimpose them, you can write the magnetic field for this electric field, and you can write the pointing vector, which is exactly the usual form. Now, there is one very important point. So we have the two waves simultaneously, as you see here. There is one important point is, if you have any conventional uh, system, uh, it should be lossless, just for the sake of arguments, and conventional system, so passive. And if you have one, two, three, five, whichever number of modes you would like, all of them always transport power independently. So for a conventional system, if I look at the pointing vector, it's always the superposition of the pointing vectors when the waves are alone. So if you have, let's say in this case, two waves, the pointing vector for a superposition is the pointing vector just for one of them, uh, the ordinary, and the pointing vector for the other, the extraordinary. And by the way, this is valid not only in electromagnetics for any type of waves. So if you have a passive system, the modes always propagate power independently. Well, and what is the reason? Well, the reason is what I'm going to show you next. Uh, if this would, was not true, something peculiar would happen. And what happens? So first of all, it's not so trivial that this, this has to be true because the pointing vector is a quadratic form. It's a product of if E field and magnetic field. And so the E field is E1 plus E2 H, the magnetic field is H1 plus H2. These two terms basically as, are the direct terms, but then you have the cross terms. So what I'm saying is that the contribution of the cross terms, which would be some kind of E1 H2 to the pointing vector, usually it's zero. But for this material, this is not true. So actually, if you do the calculation for this non-emission material, this is not true. If you do the calculation for the pointing vector for our wave, what you find is that there is a contribution from the extraordinary wave, which I pinpointed here, another one from, from, for the ordinary wave, which is here, and then there is a cross-term contribution. And this cross-term contribution, because it mixes the two modes and because they have different propagation constants, this cross-term contribution, there, there is a very important property. It's going to vary in space. And so if the cross term is not zero, you can have a pointing vector that varies in space, but if the pointing vector varies in space, well, then you are either pumping energy to the system or absorbing energy from the system. And so you cannot have a lossless emission system, okay? And so this is why in standard platforms, this term is always zero if they are emission. But if they are not emission, this term does not have to be zero. And indeed, in this specific context, it gives rise to what we call a power beating, 
uh, which uh, I'm going to illustrate next. So the pointing vector varies. And because these exponents are, uh, uh, so the argument of the exponents are is real valued, this means that it's going to be a, a sinusoidal type oscillation. And so we get this type of variation of the pointing vector as a function of the propagation distance. So the wave, let's say, starts at this point with some frequency, and then we just let it propagate. It's a superposition of two waves, as I explained. If it would be just one wave, the pointing vector, again, I emphasize, would be a constant. But for a superposition, what you get is this power beating. So the, the power for in some regions increases, which means the wave transports more power. So the wave was amplified in this active region. But then it gets to a point where it starts being dissipated. And they alternate. So first of all, this is a very peculiar thing because it's a material that can amplify and that can uh, attenuate. Okay, the same material can behave as an amplifier or as a attenuator. We are not changing materials; it's a uniform, homogeneous material. Okay. And what controls if the material is going to decide to amplify or if it's going to decide to attenuate? It's the phase difference between the field components. So basically, it's related to the phase between the components perpendicular of the electric field perpendicular to the direction of propagation, in this case, EX and EZ. So let me show you the formulas that explain uh, this very clearly. So you can ask where does the gain come from? Well, first of all, one thing I didn't mention, so let me remind you, we start an analogy with transistors. Transistors, we know they are active devices. And so it's, first of all, it's not surprising that if we are playing with a metamaterial that should imitate a transistor that we can have gain. And so there should be some uh, physical mechanism that can pump energy to this system, okay? And this is the first observation. But let's forget the physical origin of the gain, just look at the Maxwell's equations and understand from the point of view of the equations, where does the, the gain come from? And so we have this permittivity tensor that you see here. And if you want to compute the power pumped or absorbed from pumped to the material or absorbed in the material, uh, what you have to compute is uh, uh, this quantity that I'm going to show you here, which basically it's the current uh, the polarization, this J is a polarization current in our case, multiplied by the electric field. And this is usually the dissipated power in the system. And this is, of course, for time harmonic variations. Now, uh, the polarization current can be written in terms of the permittivity, as you know, it's a very simple formula. And so we can write this in terms of this permittivity tensor. It's a one line equation. And uh, well, it's, it's here, you are seeing here the formula. And if you simplify uh, all these, not surprisingly, you find that uh, there can be dissipation of power if uh, what is here in red is not zero. So first observation that uh, uh, it's kind of expected, this will be zero if this uh, uh, interesting term epsilon xz is zero. If it's non-zero, then this term can be non-zero. Uh, well, if this is zero, the dissipated power is always zero. We are assuming that epsilon is real value, let, let me emphasize. Now, even more interesting, you see, as I mentioned, that the power dissipated is controlled by the product of the cross components of the electric field, so E, X, and Z, and uh, they are combined as you see it here. In particular, you see that if E, X, and Z are in phase, this means this will be a real number, then it will be zero. So this means that for linear polarizations, which is the case of the eigenmodes, by the way, you never have a, a dissipation or you never have gain. However, if the polarization at a certain point in the medium is not linear, this means that this coefficient will be non-zero, which means that this power can be zero. And the sign can be anything because if you flip the polarization, for example, if you flip the sign of EX, of course, this sign will be flipped, which means if you can have gain, you can also have phase. And so in summary, the dissipation and the gain is controlled by the polarization. And depending on the polarization, you can have either amplification or attenuation, okay? So it's the polarization that controls everything. And I have here a sketch that illustrates this nicely. This is the same example I showed you previously where you see the power beating and the pointing vector varying as the wave goes. And uh, you see that there are some points where you have 
stronger amplification, it's specifically this region here. And it turns out that this is, and you can understand from the formula I showed you uh, uh, in the previous slide, it, this corresponds to a circular polarization. So actually the circular polarizations are the ones that activate the gain or the loss. And so for one of the circular polarizations, you have strong amplification. For the other polarization, for the other circular polarization, you have strong attenuation, it's this point here. And in the points where you see these inflections and you, where you see that the way, uh, inflections, no, where you see the, the minima and the maxima, it's the linear polarizations where there is no amplification, no attenuation. Okay, so this concludes the first part of uh, uh, my talk. Uh, and now I have a, a couple of proposals uh, how to implement this net material. And so the first proposal is like the most straightforward. And it's just a 1D version of the metamaterial. And since we started with an analogy with transistors, it will be a transmission line uh, uh, model where we just uh, imitate this response using transistors. So this is like the straightforward implementation. And so basically we have two polarizations, EX and EZ, okay? And so if you want to do emission lines, you, need, you want to make like EX correspond to a voltage in this analogy, EZ should correspond to another voltage. And so you need two transmission lines. And so this is what I depict here, two transmission lines. Each line represents a polarization, okay? And now we want to have this exotic non-symmetric response, this epsilon, this permittivity, which you see here. And so the way to imitate this, so this primitivity, um, exotic terms, they are controlled by, so the primitivity will correspond to a capacitance in the transmission line analogy. So for example, if you just stick with epsilon XX should be the usual capacitance of the transmission line per unit of length. Uh, C22 will be the same for the second line. And then you have the cross terms, epsilon XZ and epsilon ZX. And these describe how the two transmission lines talk to each other. So they are mutual capacitances. So if you want to have this type of exotic response, you need to make the transmission lines talk to each other in an asymmetric way. Like the coupling from one line to the next one uh, is not the same as uh, if you switch uh, their roles. So let's say this one can talk to this one, but not the opposite. And so this is our system. So this is a micro strip line implementation. Um, so this, this is the ground plane and this is the first line. So it's a conductor So for the transmission line with the ground, the same for the second line. And now you must have some uh, uh, coupling between them, this capacitive coupling that is asymmetric. And we do this simply by loading these transmission lines with MOSFETs, standard MOSFETs. So I'll not bother you with details. Uh, there are other things that I want to discuss. Uh, but basically this analogy works perfectly. It is exactly uh, the same model that I've been discussing with a minor difference. So actually if you do the homogenization, homogenize this and find an equivalent continuous model, not discrete because of the loading, you find that, uh, well, C11 will be some real number equivalent to the epsilon XX. C22 will be some real number equivalent to epsilon ZZ. C21 will be zero equivalent to epsilon ZX equal to zero. And then you have this C12, which is equivalent to epsilon XZ. There is a small difference, which is now it's dispersion, the dispersion, and it's an imaginary coupling rather than a real valued coupling, which is what I discussed earlier. Well, even with this model and even with, with this complex coupling, if you consider ideal transistors, which basically uh, have infinite input impedance and zero output uh, uh, impedance. In this case, you get power beating uh, responses. And this is for this transistor, for a commercial transistor with the approximation that input impedance infinite and the output uh, resistance is zero. You get uh, a response that is qualitatively analogous to what I showed you previously with the idealized, idealized met material. Now, if you take into account the complete model of the transistor, namely the fact that it has a dissipative response in terms of the output resistance, this is the uh, most crucial element. You also see a, a power beating, uh, but now not so strong because of this dissipation. So basically you see the power beating being weighted in the line. So this is one realization of our system, the most straightforward uh, one. 
Okay, so I want to discuss another possible realization, in this case with the space-time modulation. And uh, as you know, people in recent years uh, have been quite interested in these metamaterials that vary in space and that vary in, in, in time. And so the primitivity can be a function of x and t if x is the propagation direction. So I'm going to focus on dimensional problems. So there is one peculiar class of space-time modulations, which is this one that I show here, where the permittivity has a traveling wave type uh, variation in space and in time. And so the permittivity as a function of x and t is of this form. And so essentially the permittivity profile moves with speed v, which is the modulation speed, along a certain direction, uh, along the direction of uh, uh, propagation. And so I'm going to this class of materials. So let me uh, just remind what you can do with this. And uh, Sebastian here was involved uh, in, uh, uh, I didn't quote the relevant reference, but he was uh, uh, involved in one of these uh, studies. Um, and one of the things that you can do with this space-time modulations, for example, is to have an, an isotropic uh, a moving medium type response. So you can imitate a moving medium. And so essentially, if you have a space-time with a certain uh, modulation speed, it can behave as an equivalent moving medium uh, described the, by uh, effective parameters. And so this is one of the things that you can do. And in particular, you can imitate a Fresnel drag. So without space-time modulation, the dispersion is symmetric. Left and right are the same. But if you put the space-time modulation because of this synthetic motion, uh, there is a, the, the dispersion will bend in a certain way. So it's not the red one, similar to the, to the bending of the dispersion due to the motion, the actual motion of a medium. So this is one of the things that you can do. Now, what we have been uh, exploring is if we can do explore also the space-time modulations to have um, uh, this MOSFET type response. So instead of having moving medium type responses, which is what is discussed here, and actually here we modulate both epsilon and mu, what I want to do is to have a MOSFET type response in terms of effective medium because of the space type modulation. And so it turns out it is possible. Uh, and we don't need to modulate the permeability, we just modulate the permittivity. And to have this space time modulation, we essentially need to, to, to have uh, something different than usual. So you need to assume that your response must, be, must have a dispersive component. And so we assume a constitutive relation of this type, so D will be epsilon zero E, plus some part of the response that responds instantaneously uh, in space and in time. So P0 is uh, some susceptibility chi zero multiplied by the electric field. And then there is a second component, P1, which will not respond instantaneously, but uh, to the electric field, will rather uh, respond uh, by means of a differential equation. Okay, so of course, all the systems that you can conceive uh, in practice, they will always have this response. And basically, consider the, the, the interaction of two oscillators. One of them responds instantaneously to the electric field. The other one does not respond instantaneously. And uh, th there is this variation in space and time of the coupling constants. OK, so uh, what you get, so we assume that we have a bilayer structure like this one, each of these layers uh, as a response, as I just described. And uh, we developed a theory to homogenize the response of this system. And so this is just a particular example to, to show you what we can get. And so we combine uh, for one of the regions, which is region A, well, these are the specific parameters that we pick for region A, for region B, uh, this one. So for region A, there is the instantaneous response, and there is also the dispersive response. For region B, just the instantaneous response, no dispersive response. And so we find the effective parameter them with the exact band diagram. And so we find that the effective model is just a primitivity tensor, that's all. And there will be diagonal elements, and this is what I'm going to show you here. And so this is the primitivity along uh, xx and yy as a function of the modulation speed, okay? And well, this one, there is nothing here very interesting. So basically, if you don't modulate the material, the equivalent Primitivity is 2.1, and it's the same for the two components. And then, if you put some 
modulation speed, they split a little bit. And so nothing too interesting here, nothing peculiar. Now, what is peculiar is if you look at the cross components, so anti-diagonal components. For the anti-diagonal components, which I plot here with different colors that you can see, you see that if velocity, modulation velocity is zero, which is this point, they're exactly the same. So you reciprocal system. But now it's the interesting effect. If you increase the modulation velocity, they separate, so they split. And so you have, they are real valued, okay, in the long wavelength limit. And so you have your MOSFET type response. So they separate and you have this uh, permittivity that is real valued, but not symmetric, this permittivity tensor. And so this is a interesting way to implement this MOSFET type response that I show here. So this moving photonic crystal, space-time related, uh, behaves effectively as a MOSFET metamaterial. So this is this angle that I discussed uh, previously, this theta. And this is theta as a function of modulation speed. So you can have uh, quite significant uh, angles. This is in degrees, so up to five degrees. Of course, these systems are very difficult to implement in practice. And uh, by the way, you see here two lines, uh, one blue, another one green. And these two lines, uh, one of them is the homogenization. The other one is what you get from the band diagram, from the exact band diagram of this system. Okay, so the homogenization is basically exact in the long wavelength limit. Okay, and uh, I, I had another implementation, but uh, since we are late, uh, maybe I should just uh, finish my talk here. And so I'll just go to the conclusion. So this would be a realization with, with natural materials. So if you want, you can ask me in the questions. And I just go to the su summary. And so just to summarize, so we introduced a, a new mechanism to break the Lorentz reciprocity uh, based on material nonlinearities in the static electric field. So this be, imitates the behavior of semiconductor transistors. Uh, very interestingly, this response is non-emission, non-reciprocal, and time reversal symmetric. So I discussed that uh, uh, this type of response can give rise uh, to a power beating because basically the modes don't transport power independently. And so there will be regions where one of the, uh, where the material can behave as an amplifier depending on the polarization or where it can depend, uh, behave as a attenuator. And finally, uh, I discussed some realizations of the system based on transmission lines loaded with transistors, based on space-time modulated systems. And uh, we believe that it can also be done with uh, uh, natural materials in some, in some circumstances. So thank you so much again for, for listening and for the, for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Mario. It was a fantastic talk. Uh, I've got thousands of questions, but I will let people in the audience ask their uh, questions first. So. Please, people, come forward with uh, any questions you would have uh, in your mind. <laughs>